So today we uh, thank you for attending the Seller Labs and Tax Jar Seller Sales Tax Boot Camp. Um, the webinar really came about through a meeting that Mark and I had at a trade show a couple months ago, and we were talking about how um, sales tax is such a uh, um, an unknown entity among FBA sellers, and really thought this would be a great way to provide information to our sellers and to the Seller Lab community about sales tax and really get an opportunity to answer your questions. We will be taking questions in the control panel. Um, I want you to know that if uh, you ask a question and your question is very specific, um, we will share those questions with Mark and, um, and he will respond via email. We're going to try to answer questions on the actual broadcast today that are more generic that will apply to more people. So. Um, please go ahead and fire your questions away within the question control panel, and uh, thank you for attending. Go ahead and flip, Mark. For those that are not uh, familiar with Seller Labs, um, Seller Labs is a software company. Um, we're based in Athens, Georgia. We were named the 2015 Most Innovative Tech Startup in Atlanta, um, and we really strive to provide and produce um, award-winning technology, uh, exceptional customer service, as well as um, educational information for our customers. And really, this, this tax charge seminar really falls into the educational side of our business. Our, our three main applications are Feedback Genius for automated feedback, Snagshout for product reviews, and Scope, which is a new product um, in beta right now for product research. So thank you guys all for attending. I'm now going to pass this over to Mark Fagiano, who is the CEO of TaxJar and has prepared a lot of information for us today on tax and FBA and why January is really the perfect storm and how to prepare yourself. So thank you for joining us today, Mark, and we look forward to hearing uh, what you have to share. Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I uh, appreciate you saying that uh, you're excited about sales tax. Don't hear that too often. So, um, okay, so we got getting started a little bit late, so I'm gonna um, get things rolling um, because we do have a, a fixed amount of time and got a lot of things to go through. Um, here's a here's a quick look at what I'm gonna cover today. Uh, we'll talk about kind of the general rules, the sales tax 101. If you're brand new to sales tax, some things to help you understand the concept. We'll talk about how to figure out if you have Nexus and where you have Nexus. I'm guessing pretty much everybody on this call does have Nexus somewhere. How much sales tax to collect and when to collect it. And then the process about filing sales tax returns. I'm happy to uh, answer questions at the end and share with you some other resources that we have. By the way, this, uh, this is a webinar that... Um, it has grown over the years. I've given it a, a number of different times, and it's all really based on kind of the most common questions and um, points that folks struggle with when it comes to trying to comply with sales tax laws. So who the heck is this guy talking? Just 30 seconds about myself. Um, all you really need to know is that what I'm most passionate about is using technology to solve complex problems for small, business, for small businesses. I'm a small business owner, um, or opened my first business about 11 years ago, 12 years ago now. I've started a handful of companies. The latest was when I started TaxJar a few years ago. And our goal is to tackle probably the most complicated problem that small businesses, especially online sellers face, which is sales tax. And our goal is to totally eliminate that problem so that folks can concentrate on the fun stuff like making more money. Um, I'm not a CPA, I'm not a tax professional, I'm just a guy who has talked to literally thousands of folks that sell online for a living, tax pros, state auditors, um, for other folks that work for states, <clears throat> and accumulated uh, kind of the knowledge that I'll share with you today. And, and really the goal of this presentation is to equip you with the information you need to make the best decisions possible for your business. So. Uh, definitely not my goal to come across as you need to do this or you need to do that. Um, just kind of presenting what your options are to help you make good decisions. So 
literally every day I talk to at least a handful of customers or potential customers and this is kind of the typical profile and this is who you know I've made this presentation for so if this rings true you're gonna hopefully get a lot out of this so typically multi-channel FBA sellers um, in other words they're selling um, on Amazon probably using FBA but also maybe have their own website maybe selling on eBay also potentially using some type of point-of-sale device to go to trade shows or craft fairs things of that sort they really want to be educated about sales tax there's a lot of bad information out there confusing poorly written information so they just they just want to know so that they can make decisions um, trying to understand Nexus better and um, typically they have sales tax being collected but it's all over the place they might have some cash they might have some in their PayPal account they might have some in their bank account from Amazon and they're just trying to figure out a faster and easier way to file returns and waste a lot less time and inevitably people say to me I just want this to go away it is a pain in my side and there's got to be a better way to deal with this stuff and then that again that's one of the reasons why tax jar exists if not the reason and that's some of the stuff that I want to help you with today so let's just real quickly go through at a high level kind of a sales tax 101 the first rule is that if sales tax gives you a headache um, you are certainly not alone and the reason the the biggest reason is because there is no federal sales tax law at least not yet um, there are a couple of laws that are being kicked around on Capitol Hill um, personally I don't expect anything to happen in the next two years especially uh, this year being a an election year so what we're left with are 45 states in the District of Columbia that have their own set of sales tax laws so we're, we're basically dealing with 46 different countries here they all have differing laws on what constitutes nexus what constitutes what's taxable and what's not how much sales tax to collect and when sales tax returns are due there are some similarities between the states but for the most part you're really dealing with unique entities so what is taxable what am I supposed to be collecting sales tax on and in general it's tangible items so um, the exceptions to that would be clothing and food that's where things tend to get a little bit interesting depending on what state that you have nexus in but for the most part tangible items are always taxable services are mostly not taxable um, I, I put a quick note in here and say that the tides might be changing um, we're seeing some uh, momentum in terms of states looking to uh, potentially tax services and a lot of that is just because states are hard up and they are looking for new sources of revenue but in general services are not taxable things like shipping gift wrapping those can be taxable and again those depend on um, what state we're dealing with so Nexus when it comes to trying to be sales tax compliant or you know understand what your responsibilities are with sales tax it all comes down to Nexus in the kind of the the simple version of what that means is that Nexus is when your business has a presence or a connection in a state that's deemed to be significant enough that you would re be required to comply with that state's sales tax laws so uh, in its real simplest form if you have Nexus you need to comply with the state's laws if you don't have Nexus you get to go have fun and do something else and not even worry about it and I'll talk in much more detail about what uh, can trigger Nexus and, and, and more about that later on in the presentation Nexus um, so sales into Nexus states versus remote sales in general and again I'll give really uh, detailed examples of this later but if you sell to a state where you have Nexus then you're required to collect sales tax if you sell to a state where you don't have uh, Nexus that's considered to be a remote sale and you're not required to collect sales tax at least not yet that's where things could change based on legislation but we're not going to worry about that today and again I'll go through this in, in much greater detail 
really important to know that sales tax is a pass-through tax. So really what you're doing is you're collecting the tax from your customers and then paying what you collect to the state. And the states typically refer to you as a collection agent, right? Because they have no way to participate in the actual transaction. So they're relying on you to do the hard work and collect the money that's owed. Um, the real key thing to note here is that you should never be paying sales tax out of pocket. So I typically hear people say, well, I don't want to comply with sales tax because I don't want to pay it. Well, if it's done the right way, you shouldn't be paying anything. Um, I'm not saying that there's, it's not work to collect it and pass it along to the state, but really you should not. You should never be dipping into your own pocket to pay the tax that's owed. And the good news is that you know this can be automated. The whole process can be automated. Again, that's you know why we started TaxJar. But starting is definitely the hardest part. Trying to, if you're listening to this and this is your kind of, you made up your mind to get sales tax compliant in 2016, you're at the, the hardest part of the, the learning curve right now. And just when you can understand more about what you need to do and what the requirements are, that's when things start to get a lot easier and when you can start automating it. So let's talk about Nexus. How do I gain Nexus? And what are the what are kind of the reasons where I why I could have Nexus in a state? So these are the very common Nexus triggers, we'll call them. If you have a retail store in a state, if you have an employee in a state, salesperson, affiliates can uh, cause Nexus, trade shows can cause nexus as well as drop shipping. Those are very common and may or may not apply to everybody um, listening today. And just to kind of further illustrate that, these are the most common that we see at tax jar. So the first one is what we call on the left home or office nexus. This is where you live and or operate your business. So if you live in San Jose, California and sell out of your house and um, fulfill out of your house, then you comply, you're required to comply with California sales tax law and collect sales tax on items that are shipped to California. And the other very common kind that probably applies to a lot of people, especially if they're FBA sellers, is inventory nexus. So this is when your inventory is stored in a third-party warehouse. So the example that I give here is if you live in San Jose and you have inventory uh, stored in Amazon's Pennsylvania warehouse, now you're asked to or you're required to comply and co collect sales tax in both California and Pennsylvania. And again, I'll, I'll go through uh, more detail on all of these, just trying to ease our way into trying to grasp some of these basic concepts. Let's just take a second to talk about drop shipping because it is, it is a more complicated scenario than what I just covered. This is basically when, uh, for those of you that don't know, two sales take place, right? Your vendor sells to you, and then you sell to your customer. The real key question is who has Nexus here? And um, we get asked about this a lot at TaxJar, and because this is so complicated, we um, typically ask folks to get in touch with a sales tax professional to help them determine exactly the Nexus scenarios here because it is again uh, so complicated, and I'm happy to um, I'm happy to refer you to a tax professional that can make some sort of Nexus assessment for you. Real quick, uh, just it, these are very generic cases, but if neither the vendor or the seller, in this case the folks that are listening today, have Nexus, um, then no taxes need to be collected. If the vendor has Nexus in a state but the seller doesn't, the seller uh, can provide an exemption certificate. If the vendor doesn't have Nexus but the seller does, um, then the seller needs to collect the sales tax. And then the last example would be both the vendor and the seller have Nexus, and that's kind of a combination, right? So the seller provides the exemption certificate to the vendor and then collects from the customer. Um, that's probably a lot to take in in one slide, but Bottom line, if, you have, if you're using drop shipping, highly recommend to get a professional's opinion on making a Nexus assessment for you. Okay, so 
that's what nexus means. Now, who cares? What, what, do you, what exactly are you supposed to do if you figure out that you have nexus? And this is where it gets into compliance. So when I say comply, this is basically what it means, that you're required to register for a sales tax license in a state where you have nexus. Then you enable collection on your card or marketplace, wherever you're selling. Oh, good. And that allows you to collect sales tax on items that are shipped to, the, to that state. File a return yeah, when the state asked you to file. Sorry, Jeff, did you say something? He uh, like sat down and had lunch with an SCOE or chat, and he's like, "Oh, maybe work with Seller Labs." All right, maybe maybe Jeff can't hear me, but we can hear you. Um, I started it, and I was like, "Oh, cool." Then um, <laughs> file a return when the state asks you to file. They'll give you a filing frequency when you register for a sales tax license. And then pay what you owe. And so when you file the return, um, you, you're then uh, also remitting the sales tax that you've collected from your customers. So that's what compliance is. Important to note that there's such a thing called multi-channel nexus, right? So if you have nexus for one channel, that means you have nexus for your entire business. So for example, if you if FBA gives you nexus. Um, then your uh, WooCommerce business, uh, the WooCommerce uh, powers your website, then you have Nexus in those states as well. So a uh, quick example, if you have Nexus in California and Pennsylvania and you're collecting sales tax through Amazon in both of those states, you got to make sure that your website collects sales tax in both of those states as well. It's not just unique to um, your Amazon business. Learn a lot about sales tax. It's good to know. Okay, so FBA um, and Nexus and sales tax. So where exactly are the FBA states? Where could my inventory potentially end up? So here's a map that shows all of the states that have um, active Amazon inventory um, fulfillment centers and where you could potentially have Nexus. This is uh, crowdsourced from, you know, we've got thousands of FBA customers. Um, one thing to note here is that Virginia just recently in Q4 of 2015 came out with a ruling that um, said that inventory in a third-party warehouse does not constitute Nexus. They did not specifically say Amazon, um, <clears throat> but if you look at the ruling in detail, it pretty much describes you know, an Amazon FBA seller. So personally, I don't think that trend is going to catch on, but that was pretty big news. And, um, you know, uh, basically the point there is that uh, you may not be required to comply in every single Amazon warehouse state going forward. One thing to note is that, and, and I actually think that things are headed in the other direction. So fulfillment, and how fast you turn around an order is a big differentiator, as you all know. And um, Amazon knows that as well. So Amazon has planned already to go online and have warehouses in more states. Um, there's also, as I've talked about a couple of times, there is federal uh, and also some state legislation that is uh, being talked about. Uh, the point that I'm trying to make here is that I don't see the number of states that where you could potentially have Nexus, especially if you're doing any sort of scale online and if you're using FBA, I don't see that number going down. In fact, I see it just only increasing in the future based on all of these uh, kind of different factors. So let's talk about collecting sales tax. Bottom line, the, the thing that you need to remember if you're going to remember one thing is that you need to collect sales tax when the item that you've sold is sh shipped to a state where you have Nexus. So I've got a couple of examples here to kind of further illustrate that. Here's Joe Seller. He's based in Akron, Ohio. He only has Nexus in Ohio, so he's only complying in one state. He makes what we call a Nexus sale, which is uh, there he is on the left-hand side in Akron and he sells to a customer and ships the item to Lakewood, Ohio, he's required to collect sales tax. If he makes a remote sale, which is to a customer in Waltham, Mass, he's shipping the item to Waltham, he doesn't have Nexus in Waltham, therefore he's not required to collect sales tax. 
So let's make this let's make the example a little bit more complicated. Let's say Joe is using a third-party fulfillment service. He stores his inventory now in Nevada, so he's got Nexus in two states. In his example, the Nexus sale would be if the item um, originates from either Ohio or Nevada, doesn't matter which one, and gets shipped to Ohio or, or Nevada, doesn't matter which one. All that matters is that it's being shipped to a state where he has Nexus, so he has to collect sales tax. A remote sale in this case would be when the item is shipped to a state, any other state other than Ohio or Nevada. In this case, it's, it's Iowa, so he's not required to collect sales tax. And just to kind of make your head spin a little bit more, um, let's say Joe is using FBA and um, he's able to, you know, kind of an imaginary world of lock in where his inventory is actually stored and it's only stored in five states. So now he's complying in six different states, um, you know, Ohio down through Indiana there on the list. For him, a Nexus sale would be if the item is shipped to any of those other five states when it's coming from Ohio, then he needs to collect sales tax. And then this is kind of the this is the the uh, the money slide, which basically what I'm trying to say here is doesn't matter where the item originates from any of his Nexus states or that it's all that matters is that it's being shipped to a state where he has nexus. So it could be a combination of from Nevada to California, California to Indiana, Pennsylvania to Ohio, it doesn't matter. All that matters is the item is being shipped to a nexus state, so he's got to collect sales tax. And the vice versa of that is a remote sale would be if the item is shipped to any state where Joe doesn't have nexus, then he's not required to collect sales tax. I know that's a quick look at it. Um, hopefully the visuals help. Ha happy to answer any questions at the end when we open it up for Q&A. So how do we actually calculate sales tax? How do we determine the right amount to collect from our customers? Well, this comes down to a term called sourcing, which you may have heard of. Uh, you probably heard of it, but not in terms of sales tax. The buyer state is the one that determines the sales tax rate. So uh, and again, I'll give some examples here in a second. The tax rate is usually a sum of applicable rates. So if you see a tax rate of 8% when you're buying something online, chances are pretty strong that it's actually a combination of rates. There's a state rate, there's a local rate, then there could be other rates combined in there too, like um, special tax for education or transportation, stadiums, things like, that, things like that. They're all just rolled up into one rate. And the rates are determined in general one or two different ways. So the first is an origin-based rate and there are, this is where the tax rate is based on the where the seller is located and in this case the seller has it easy because they're only collecting one rate for the entire state. Again, I'll show you some visuals here in a second. Unfortunately, there are twice as many destination-based states. This is when the tax rate is variable, um, and it's variable because it depends on where the item is actually being shipped. So here's an example of an origin sale. Texas is an origin-based state. The sellers on the left in Irving sells to some ships to somebody in Archer City. The sales tax rate is eight and a quarter percent. So that seller in Irving, no matter where he ships to in Texas, he's always going to charge eight and a quarter percent. And you can see that eight and a quarter percent is made up of state, local rate, and there's also a special um, mass transit tax. A destination sale. Uh, we'll go to New York, a destination state. The, the seller is in Stanford, the buyer is in Buffalo. The tax rate that's applicable here is sourced on the uh, where the item is shipped to. It's eight and three quarters percent. That's the effective tax rate in where this person lives in Buffalo. And that's made up of a state rate of four percent and then the rest is the uh, local Erie County rate. Okay, so let's talk about if you're selling on Amazon, what does that mean for collecting sales tax? The key here is, um, fortunately, uh, there's, there's good news here. Um, you really only have to focus on where you have Nexus. 
So all the all the examples that I gave you on sourcing and tax rates, you can put all of that into Amazon's hands. They'll collect the tax for you. They have a tax collection service in Seller Central. It's very low cost. I highly recommend it. Um, and actually, you have no no choice really. So if you're going to collect sales tax on Amazon, you have to use their service. And it's uh, for for uh, for the cost. It's a very robust and from what we've seen, a pretty darn accurate service. They'll take care of figuring out you know what the tax rate should be if an item is taxable um, in a particular state. And that all comes down to product tax code. So I want to talk one second about that. It's a really good idea if you want to collect as accurately as possible to set up your product tax codes so that Amazon basically knows the difference between if you're selling a chair versus if you're selling you know, a grocery item versus a hoodie. If you don't have them tagged that way, Amazon won't know the difference, so they'll treat them all from a taxability perspective the same. So I uh, really highly recommend getting those right up front um, when you start collecting sales tax on Amazon. Now the flip side, the bad news here if you're a seller on Amazon is that you do have to enable the sales tax collection. So we, we on occasion hear from sellers who are getting ready to file their returns and they haven't collected a dime of sales tax yet uh, because they assume that Amazon took care of everything for them. So. Uh, that unfortunately is not the case. It's up to you to go into Seller Central, sign up for the service, and enable the, the collection. Amazon will not do anything, as you probably know, to trigger um, you to sign up. They will not tell you where you have Nexus. They will not alert you if you gain Nexus in a new state, anything like that. They will not even tell you, really give you good documentation on how to enable collection within a state. So it's very easy from what we've seen to collect incorrectly. And as a response to that, we put together very early in the company, we put together an ebook. You can get it at fbasalestax.com. And basically at the very end, there's a cheat sheet that has a table that shows you exactly how to fill in sales tax collection, whether you're a remote seller or uh, a native seller in a particular state. So highly recommend picking that up, especially if you're going to comply in states other than your own. Spend a second on eBay because a lot of Amazon sellers sell on eBay as well. There's actually more bad uh, news than good in the case of eBay. Good news is limited. You can collect sales tax, but you can only put in a flat rate per state. So if you think about the type of sourcing, the origin versus destination, where destination is variable, it's literally impossible. You cannot put in a variable rate within uh, PayPal. So for destination-based states, you cannot collect accurately. Uh, um, so that's a problem. Uh, what do you do about it? We've talked to dozens and dozens of tax pros about this, and you got two options. One is you can charge the state rate and pay the local rate out of pocket. Um, I, I personally don't recommend that. I don't think you should pay anything out of pocket. The other thing you can do here, and tax pros uh, overwhelmingly agree to this, is charge the highest rate in the state. So pick the highest possible rate and um, collect on that rate and make sure that you pay the state whatever you're collected. So don't pocket the difference. That's one of the worst things that you can possibly do when it comes to this stuff. Um, yeah, there, there may be some customers that um, you know complain that you're charging them too much. We don't hear that too often. Um, but you know, worst case, just refund them the difference. Um, but this way, again, uh, the onus isn't on you. You're not paying anything out of pocket. Margins are thin enough as it is. Why start paying states for the taxes that you should be collecting from your customers? Okay. Filing returns. So this is kind of the last step in the progression. We've talked about you know, how to think about compliance, what causes compliance, the actual part of collecting. Now you have the money. How, how do you actually get the money to the state and file the returns? So 
filing deadlines are usually tied to sales volume. Um, the frequencies differ, so there are annual, you could be paying semi-annual, quarterly or monthly. Usually, you know, larger volume sellers are paying monthly, lower volume sellers are, are filing and paying annually. Um, deadlines, they're all different for every state, but they typically fall between the 15th and the last day of the month. And again, the more you collect, the, the more often you pay. Uh, the logic there is that, you know, the states, if you've got collecting a lot of money, they just want you to pay them more often. Make sure you combine and file a single rate per state. So you're, if you're multi-channel, you don't file one return for eBay, one for your website, one for Amazon. It's up to you to combine all that information together and file one return. And then the last thing is, once you're committed and you've got a sales tax permit in a state, and let's say they ask you to file quarterly, they want you to file something quarterly. It doesn't matter if you've taken a hiatus, if you've gone on sabbatical, or if you didn't make a sale to that particular state, they want to hear from you. So even if you didn't make one, state, one sale to a state, make sure you file a return saying, you know, my revenue in that state was zero. I didn't make one sale. Some states, Texas is the most infamous for this, they'll actually fine you 50 bucks if you don't at least file that zero sales tax return. So super important once you make the commitment to make sure that you are filing something by each of the deadlines. Paying on time can benefit you uh, in some states. They'll actually uh, give you some sort of discount. So that's free money. Highly recommend that you take advantage of that. Again, margins are thin enough as it is. Unfortunately, all of the states will find a way to penalize you if you're late. So we, of course, hate that. Um, we see, you know, uh, customers that are filing returns at 12:30 in the morning when the deadline was 12 o'clock. The states will already have built into their website um, the capabilities to assess penalties and interest on, you know, what should have been paid 30 minutes earlier. So definitely in your best interest to file on time. And uh, in certain cases, you know, the state will actually give you some money back for doing that. Filing returns in destination-based states, that's where things can ratchet up a little bit in terms of complexity. And that's because the states rely on you, the seller, to tell them how much you've collected by every jurisdiction within the state. So it's not enough when you're filing to New York to just say, hey, I collected um, $750 this quarter. They want to then know how that $750 is split up between all of the counties in New York. So this is a very hard task. This is the biggest reason why tax charge exists. And where this gets really hard is if you're multi-channel because now you've got a spreadsheet from your eBay store, you've got another one from your Shopify store, and then you've got um, you know, a report that you pulled with Amazon as well. And uh, you're trying to go through each sale to categorize it and subtotal it by every jurisdiction within the state. Not the greatest um, screenshot in the world, but this is a, a good example of what the state of Washington, a destination-based state, requires a seller to do. Here are five jurisdictions. They're asking for the taxable sales within each of the states. And here's how, kind of how TaxJar answers that. So TaxJar's local reports will show um, total sales and taxable sales as well as the taxes collected, um, both the actual taxes collected and what should have been collected on a state-by-state -state basis. So li basically eliminating, right, all of that time it would take you to, to do this manually by spreadsheet. Always a good idea to save everything in case of uh, an audit. Basically, the, what you should remember here is if you file, if you put something down on your return, an amount, you basically could have to prove it down the road. So if you're putting down that you had 100000 in sales, make sure that you can prove that if the state calls you out on it. Same with the amount of sales tax that you've collected. If you're in a situation where you have exemption certificates, make sure you keep those up to date. That's very important. That can be a very common way to trigger a sales tax audit. We have some information there on that uh, URL that has the requirements for how long you need to retain information on a state-by-state -state basis. Okay, so let's, let's take a deep breath. If I was giving this um, talk in person, 
then uh, I would ask how you were feeling. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask anyway, and this is probably the look that I would see on everybody's face. That was the brave souls that would be sitting in the audience. Um, so this is how you're feeling. Uh, that's actually very normal, and and you're not alone. And the you know the most common question is, well, what the heck do I do? What are my options? Where do I, where do I go from here? So again, um, not a tax professional, not a CPA, not a lawyer, but I. I've seen thousands and thousands of cases and talk to the states and sticking your head in the sand and, and doing nothing is is really not a good option um, and the reason being uh, is because number one tax jar will bend over backwards to to help you get the information you need so the excuse that there was five years ago that the all of the information that was out there was confusing we're, we're doing everything we can to eliminate that we're open and honest about educating sellers so that they can can tackle this head on and the, the other thing I know the slide is hilarious slash gross but w one of the things that we found is that best effort is certainly better than no effort so if you talk to the states like we do all the time they'll tell you they're thrilled to death if you're complying right they're having um, in some cases a difficult time to get people to comply because it is so complicated and they know that so the, the common example that I always give here is if you owe a thousand dollars to a state and by no fault of your own collect nine hundred and seventy eight dollars and that's what you pay the state doesn't care absolutely couldn't care less they're thrilled that you're complying they know that this is complicated especially when it comes to e-commerce this stuff is all cutting edge and they'll take your 978 and they'll move on they'll look for cases where someone has um, you know, thousands to tens of thousands of dollars that has, or even more, that hasn't been collected um, that they see as worth their time to go after that person. So, uh, the bottom line is you don't have to drain resources here trying to be 100% perfect. There is no perfect when it comes to sales tax, and it shouldn't be a huge drain on your margins to to get automated and make this happen. If you're thinking about if you're if you're thinking about becoming compliant in 2016, um, my recommendation would be to at least comply in your home state, right? So that's the state where you're based. That's the state where your business is registered. That's the state where you're filing income tax. That's the state that knows that you exist. So in theory, the the it's not a a, a long line that they have to draw between figuring out that um, you should be collecting sales tax. So at the very least, start there. Get a sales tax license there. Start collecting on items that are being shipped to uh, customers in your state. And from there, branch out to new states. So if you're an FBA seller, uh, this really comes down to risk tolerance. Is it worth you getting a sales tax license to for Indiana when you make two sales there a year? My opinion, Absolutely not. But some people feel very strongly that they just want to comply everywhere where they are required. They don't even want to think about it. They want to get it done once and um, and be over and be through with it. I, and I get that. But um, to me, it really comes down to what your risk tolerance is. When you look at your sales to Indiana or Texas, is the money that you potentially owe them um, is that money that would put you out of business if the state sent you a letter or gave you a call and said, hey, look, it's time to pay up. Uh, to comply, again, you need to register and then start collecting and filing. And, you know, this is the perfect time of year to get started. One other thing I'll just throw out there is that, you know, as I mentioned, risk tolerance is your guide. States are getting more desperate. They're starting to catch on that there, there's a windfall for them potentially in e-commerce. We're starting to see states take things into their own hands write their own laws about Nexus or update their laws about Nexus to get creative to figure out ways to get more taxpayers uh, required to file. So legislation may not come this year, may not come next year, but um, uh, most experts agree that it is is coming soon. Um, and uh, you know now's a perfect time to at least start paying attention. So when it comes, uh, you know you're not surprised. And that's one of the things I recommend. At least Pay attention. Tax chart can help you do that. Um, 
to various changes that are going on with laws just so you that you're it's better to be in the know. Okay, I'm going to talk quickly about how we can make your lives easier when it comes to this stuff. As I mentioned, tax chart is we're painless sales tax compliance for online sellers. We do everything from um, calculating how much needs to be collected in situations where you need that um, to uh, giving you automated reports and we'll file your sales tax returns for you. We've got thousands of um, paying customers, some of the names you, um, that you may recognize here, um, but they are um, you know, literally millions of dollars, um, billions of dollars coming through um, tax jar um, on a yearly basis uh, for, from um, some pretty recognizable names uh, that are uh, thrilled to death about the, the time and effort that we can save them. We integrate with all of these uh, very common marketplaces, points of sale devices, and uh, website platforms. And basically what that allows you to do is connect a single time. For example, you connect your Amazon to TaxJar once. We pull down your sales and uh, tax data on a daily basis. You only have to make that connection once. You don't have to go back. You don't have to upload any data. Um, and uh, we give you uh, the following information to kind of help you make decisions. So first, do you know where you have Nexus? Well, TaxJar can help you with that. So here's a sample report. Um, those badges next to some of the states basically shows um, that we've identified that orders are being shipped from these states, which indicates that you have Nexus in those states. And again, that, that would, uh, in this case, it applies to Amazon sellers. Do you know what your sales and taxes collected are on a state-by-state -state basis? Well, we provide that automatically um, on your dashboard that you can log into every day. So here are, here, this particular seller needs to comply in these four states. We remind them of their deadlines, how often they're filing, how much sales tax they've collected to date, if they're collecting accurately. How about how much sales tax did you collect by every jurisdiction? So we talked about this a little bit earlier, but we'll break down. Depending on what the requirements are for a particular state, we will break it down to show you exactly uh, the data that you need to be able to go ahead and file that return on your own much quicker than if you, could, if you had to do it manually. What about are you collecting accurately or not? So we show both the actual sales tax collected and the, and the amount that you should have collected. This comes into play for folks that didn't collect anything. Uh, maybe they were collecting midway through a filing period. Maybe they were only collecting the state tax and they totally omitted um, the local tax. Well, this, this will trigger an alert to you that will show you that, you know, for example, you may need to go into Amazon and change your settings so you don't have to pay anything out of pocket going forward. Really, how long does it take you to file? So without these local reports, are you doing this by spreadsheet? You know, customers tell us pretty often um, the average number is three to five hours that it takes them to manually compile this data and put it together and then go ahead and file the return. With TaxJar, it takes them, you know, 15 minutes or less depending on um, the size of the seller and the complexity of the state. We also have what's called auto file. It's an automated filing service. It's available to any of the states in green. We're expanding the service all the time. Um, there'll be more green states later on this year. Um, but basically what this does is for an additional fee, we'll file the return um, on time for you. So you literally we're closing the gap. You don't have to do anything. We'll take your local report and then go ahead and file the correct amount to the state. If you want to get started, we offer a 30-day free trial. Just go to taxjar.com. We have both monthly and annual subscriptions. They start at $19 a month. It's all based on transactional volume. So that's for up to 1,000 transactions. Uh, and then if we're going to file returns for you, then it's $19.95 for each return.
We love talking to customers, so if you have any questions, don't hesitate to uh, call us and wanted to just share some other resources with you. So um, we're on uh, YouTube for, the, for you folks that are more visual learners. We've got a bunch of videos on there. We've got a community on Facebook with 4,000 sellers and growing. Our blog is um, uh, Jennifer Dunn from our team does an absolutely incredible job of adding content on there on a daily basis. It's just for e-commerce sellers. And then uh, check out FBASalesTax.com. So that's it, Jeff. That's uh, that's all we have for uh, for today. Happy to spend as much time as needed um, a answering questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you very much. I I know uh, my head was spinning. I know I followed uh, sales tax at Nexus for a long time. I was in the textbook industry and in the book industry, which is where a lot of the Nexus started um, with the affiliates and stuff. And so it's uh, it's a whirlwind. Um, for sellers and and we've gotten a lot of really good questions so um, I'd like to try to fly through as many of these as possible um, and if they're overly detailed we can uh, we can take them offline and answer them via a blog so just kind of let me know Mark um, one of the questions that came up was does tax jar file county sales tax as well as state sales tax what did they mention a particular state um, no, but I think they were just asking, uh, it was Michelle, so if Michelle, if you want to send a follow-up, we can look there and see. So for uh, most states, um, it's one and the same, you're just filing one, one return. There are a couple of states that require local returns as well, Arizona being probably the most common example for people listening. We don't have automated filing capabilities to Arizona yet. Um, but that's something that you know we're working on and uh, you know hope to have in the future. Um, if if a seller has more than one Amazon account, do they need to have more than one tax jar account? They don't. Nope. So they can add, add as many Amazon accounts. They can add multiple eBay accounts. They can add everywhere they're selling to one single uh, tax jar account. So this question came up from a couple of people. Um, I just realized I never enabled any tax collection in six months of, S of FBA. I thought Amazon was collecting it. Do I have to pay out of my own pocket? In all likelihood, yes. Um, now, where that could get a little bit of a gray area is, you know, when you put on your sales tax permit, if you've even registered for one at this point, when you said your first day of sales took place, um, always a good idea to probably, you know, make up and start with the state with a clean slate um, and say that you had sales uh, that where you didn't collect any tax and get that over with and pay that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there, you obviously you can't go back to your customers in those cases. So, uh, unfortunately, you will probably have to reach out of your own pocket and, and pay what's owed. So Monica wants to know, and I'm sure some other people as well, um, she just wanted to be clear, as an FBA seller, if any of our inventory is in an FBA warehouse out of my state, we pay taxes there because she's only been paying in her own state. Yeah, so to be clear, inventory being stored in a <clears throat> remote state, so that's a state other than your own or a state where you have Nexus, that can trigger Nexus. So for an FBA seller, if they've got you know inventory in those Amazon warehouses, then in all likelihood they do have Nexus in other states. And if you have Nexus in other states, the law in almost all of those states says that you are required to comply with our sales tax laws, get a sales tax permit, and collect on sales that are shipped to that particular state. So most FBA sellers you know, that are customers of ours anyway, I should say, you know, they're complying in multiple states, two, three, five, 12, 15 states. Great. So the follow-up question to that, which was asked by Jennifer, was how do we know which warehouse Amazon stores our inventory in? So we'll actually tell you that. Textjar will tell you. There, um, you can also look on our blog. We've um, written a post about 
how you can pull down a report from Amazon. Um, the problem is you literally have to pull that on a daily basis um, because Amazon is, as we all know, they're, they're moving your inventory around like crazy. So we've simplified that. We've built that as a feature in the tax jar, and we can tell you where um, your items are being shipped from, so what warehouses, what states. All right, so you opened yourself up to this by saying the tax jar can do this for me. Um, Fran has a question and wants to know, how can I do things by myself? I don't make enough money selling on Amazon yet to justify paying for a service. Um, I mean, so you basically would have to uh, uh, pull down reports from Amazon and manually, depending on what state that she's in, uh, manually compile sales on a per jurisdiction basis and uh, I don't have a great recommendation on how to do that some some other sellers may be able to share like spreadsheets they've used um, but yeah, there, I would there's, also there's no simple, that, simple way to do it I would also say as, uh, as as somebody who who does not have you know I, I'm not pitching um, mark service um, although you know we we do heavily uh, support Mark and his business and believe that it's a great business and, and that people should try it, it's important that sellers focus on seller activities and not things that take away from their seller activities and sometimes making an investment into something that that takes up a lot of your time um, is just part of the cost of doing business and just to be um, very clear, um, you know, one of the things that I think you know, and, and Mark said this at the beginning, you should, you need to determine your own risk tolerance. And it's possible you believe that your own risk tolerance at the beginning of being an FBA seller is to do very little with tax. But remember that as your business grows, so will your liabilities. So you have to just kind of determine where your comfort level is with that. Um, so one of the other questions that came up by a couple of sellers was, I'm from the UK, I'm from Canada, I'm from China, um, but I sell my products in the US. Um, does this all apply to me? Uh, yeah, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it does. So states don't really care at the end of the day whether or not the seller is based in Ohio or they're based in the UK. All that matters is that um, you know the the inventory is being stored in that state, and you know it's it's the exact same. So, yeah, compliance for an international seller is a little bit trickier. Uh, there's kind of an extra added layer there, but um, by no means are international sellers deemed immune from these laws just because they're not based here. So, what about a seller who is um, sell who lives in um, China and sells in the UK? Then um, they have no tax nexus in the U.S. They only really need to worry about it if they're actually selling products in the U.S. Yeah, I mean, the focus of this entire talk has really just been on domestic U.S. sales tax. So, if they absolutely if they don't make any sales here um, and they don't have any of those. Um, nexus triggers that we talked about, then yeah, they, they're lucky they don't have to worry about it at all. And, and um, you know, what constitutes nexus in the UK? Uh, that's a whole other, that's a whole other conversation. Great. Um, so, is there a certain dollar amount that you would suggest as a threshold for filing in a particular state? So there's not a literal threshold, and this really is where it comes down to risk tolerance, right? Um, uh, the kind of the barometer that I hear customers use when I talk to them is a, an amount that makes them uncomfortable. And again, that amount would be if the state wrote me a letter, and this does happen, we, we hear from customers that this happens, and they say you owe X amount of dollars, and, and it's really just the amount that you should have collected, Given where your business is, is that an amount that will cripple the business? So, you know, if you're a high volume seller that for some reason doesn't do a lot of business in Indiana, and Indiana uh, could at most send you a letter for a thousand dollars, and that's a drop in the bucket for you, then you know that's one side of it. If a thousand dollars is a, an amount of money that you do not have on hand. Um, and would potentially put you out of business or you know really hurt your business 
then that kind of that should make the decision for you. And again, if you're doing it the right way, right, Jeff, you should be collecting it from your customers. So, yeah, I think a lot of the people that are coming through with their questions are realizing that they've um, haven't been collecting it or haven't started paying it. So one of the questions. Um, that I saw come through was okay. I haven't been collecting it, and I haven't been paying it. Um, does can Tax Jar help me pay my back taxes, even though I know it's going to come out of my own pocket? So this is um, the the short answer is yes, um, but it really is a taken on a case by case basis. So there's a lot of, as you can imagine, there's a lot of potential complexity. It just depends on the size of the seller. It depends on what state we're dealing with. So we do have answers. We do have some services that apply. Um, one of the things that we, this is a very common case that we hear, um, and we've partnered up with uh, and vetted um, sales tax professionals throughout the country who we feel very comfortable sending our customers to in cases like this. So if we can't do anything for you directly, we will um, very confidently put you in, in good hands that, that, that can take care of you. Great. So we're at the top of the hour, actually a couple minutes past the hour, but since we started a few minutes late, I'm going to keep going on the webinar. I understand people have other time conflicts, and if they need to drop off, we will have a recording of the webinar available, as well as um, Mark's slides um, on our blog later um, today or early tomorrow. So, um, But there's a lot of great questions coming through, and I want to give an opportunity to answer as many as we can. Um, Eddie wanted to just confirm one thing with you, Mark. Um, if you're using Amazon's tax collection service and assuming that the product codes are set correctly, um, then they determine the actual tax percentage to charge and you as a seller don't have to worry. Right. So as long as if, you've, if you do have the product tax code set up correctly and you've enabled tax collection in a state, then they will do all the math uh, behind the scenes to make sure that the uh, the correct amount of sales tax is being collected. They'll do all that hard part. But again, you've got to set up the product tax codes yourself, and you've got to physically go in and enable the collection on a state-by-state -state basis. Great. I love how you're rolling from one question to the other, and you don't even know what the questions are. So then with FBA, should you collect for all the states where you could potentially have Nexus? or only collect once you have Nexus in a potential state? Uh, that comes down to, for me, that comes down to the risk tolerance question again. So the two sides of the, two answers are the conservative answer, which is um, I don't care where I am in my business. I don't like the idea of potentially not complying in any state. I'm just going to get this over with and collect everywhere. And I understand that. That's not the way how, how I would play it. I would I would do what we talked about before, which is kind of using risk tolerance as my guide. I definitely would not do that if I'm a new seller, when really you should be worried about trying to validate your business first. Then you know spending, to your point, Jeff, spending tons of time you know with paperwork. Um, the other side of that again is the you know the risk tolerance argument, which is okay. I'm going to set some sort of internal threshold and use that as my guide. When I start selling at a certain volume to Texas, I'm going to go comply there. I'm going to then comply in Indiana when it gets at that threshold. And I'll just start with my home state and um, you know, kind of pick off additional states um, as my volume increases. Great. I've seen this question come through twice, so I'm going to read it to you in two different ways. But the basic question is, does Amazon report to the states? So one question asked by Jeff was, I haven't, I've been a seller for a year, I haven't collected tax, is it risky to say January 1st was the first day when I obtained license in a state? Um, and then you know, ultimately, how do sta states even know that a sales occurred? Um, is Amazon doing the reporting? Okay, a, couple, a few different questions in there. <clears throat> um, to the one about, uh, should I use January 1 as my initial start date um, really depends on the business so um, let's say you had you know if you if you're a high volume seller and you have a history I, I don't recommend it because if the state finds out you basically would have lied on your permit and say no I don't 
don't have a history. If the state finds out that you do have a history, um, then they will come after you for uh, the taxes that you should have owed and the penalties will be stiffer. And if you think about it, the more taxes you're paying, they're, they're probably more likely to say, this guy didn't come out of nowhere. Um, you know, uh, he probably does have a history that he's not admitting to. <clears throat> if you're a low volume seller, could you get away with saying January 1 is your start date and, um, and um, the state not find out about those past sales? Probably. Um, but again, uh, similar as what we talked about before, you know, do you want to um, use something like a voluntary disclosure agreement and kind of come clean, so to speak, start off fresh with the state so that you close the door on that and um, not even have a possibility of the state coming after you for, for you know, period prior to the start date. Hopefully that answers the question. Um, the second question was, trying to remember now, I spoke too um, long. Does Amazon actually report the tax to the state? So uh, this is an interesting question. We, we can't substantiate the fact that, uh, you know, Amazon is uh, sharing uh, seller names or amounts or anything like that. We have heard rumors from pretty credible sources, but I've never seen you know a, a perfect example of that. So look, uh, I mean, if 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 you're sitting in California and you're thinking there's no way on earth that Indiana is going to find out about me and my you know smaller business, you're probably right. Um, but on the other hand. Um, uh, again, it's in the state's best interest to get up to speed on this. We're seeing them get smarter. We we know that they know that there's money on the table when it comes to e-commerce. So um, uh, you know, the way I look at it is the the larger volume that you're doing, the 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 more you're putting yourself at risk that the state could find out about you. But there is no to answer the question. There is no. Uh, super clear path where you know Indiana is getting a database file uh, from Amazon that says well these are all the people that have Nexus uh, and, and if there is we've never seen that uh, you know proven. Great. Um, 2016 where's tax jar going? Are there certain states that you'll be working to implement? The specific question was will you have Texas soon but I wanted to make it a little bit more Generic into, um, you know, what, where where do you guys see 2016 going in terms of your your future development? Yeah, so Texas is definitely high on the list. Um, uh, Washington, Arizona, those are um, very um, commonly asked for states, and we're working hard to to basically fill in those um, you know last remaining 10 or so states that we don't currently support. So um, that's part of where we're going. I mean, um, look, we're a, we're a totally 100% customer-driven company. So we've got a nice focused list of features and enhancements that we're working like crazy on right now, and it's all because customers are our customers are awesome. They share feedback. They give us ways to make the product even better, and you know that's our goal is to to make this as um, as painless as possible. So. That's where we're headed. Great. Well, um, I know there's been a lot of questions asked, and, and and I apologize. I know we got through a lot of them, and we didn't get through all. Um, I will be sharing the questions with Mark so that him and his team can um, can reply back if your question wasn't asked. Mark, can you go back to the slide, um, a couple of slides back, where you have the information with your URL and stuff like that, so everybody can kind of see that um, there, um, and then you know. I would say that now is the time you should be asking questions about sales tax. That's why we scheduled this webinar to be early in the year. I know there's a lot of questions in the in the audience about what do I need to do for 2015 and how do I prepare for 2016. Hopefully this began to provide you some of that information. Um, we will continue to work with TaxJar to put information on our blog and to share with our community. But as you can see, there is you know, a wealth of information directly from TaxJar and their community on FBA and multi-channel selling. So, um, you know, we don't recommend a lot of products at Seller Labs outside of our ecosystem. But uh, Mark and and uh, his team have been exceptional in every 
um, aspect of, of us and working with them over uh, the period of time that we've known each other and we've heard nothing but great things from their customers. So we really wanted to share with our community what TaxJar does and how they do it and try to get your questions answered. So thank you, Mark, for coming on um, today. Thank you, um, audience, because you know obviously none of this works without you and um, hopefully this was a, a good use of your time. Before you sign off, if you could just kind of um, share with us and 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 the questions and let us know if if this was a valuable use of your time or an, um, a, a bad use of your time we would appreciate it feedback is always wanted um, both tax jar and seller labs uh, we customer centric and and looking to um, provide more content that makes uh, your lives as sellers better so are both thank you all for coming on today and um, we wish you all a very prosperous 2016.